Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah, for reading. Thank you, uh, Will, for praying. So we've, uh, we've read, we've prayed. Let's dive straight into Matthew 15 as we continue our uh, journey through this part of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, one of the problems we face, one of the dif difficulties we, we face uh, when we think about God is that we tend to start with ourselves and I think God is just, well, just a little bit bigger and no doubt a little bit better which is to say that we create God in our own image. We have the same sort of problem often when it comes to Jesus as well. We begin to start, when we think about him, if we think about him, we think of him as pretty much like ourselves and then just finesse things a bit. And it's not just us, I think, that tend to do that. People have always done that throughout history. I mean, if you look at the way Jesus is depicted in uh, art through the centuries, through Western art, you'll see that uh, he looks very much like uh, the times of the artist who is painting him, reflecting the culture, the fashions. We all do it, and it's a problem. Why is it a problem? Well, because God is not a figment of our imagination. We don't create him, he created us. He is as he is, he is who he is, and he does what he does, depending on who he is, not on who we might think he should be. God is. And we come to know him, not by creating him in our own image, but by accepting the revelation that he's given of himself through his word, through his word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Given that that's the case, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise, although it often is, when we discover that Jesus is not as we might imagine him to be. One of the reasons it's good to read and reread the Gospels and revisit them again and again is that it's too easily we slip into thinking that Jesus is not as he is, but as we might want him to be. And that matters. It, it really matters because Christian faith is knowing and trusting God as he is. The real Jesus, not one of our imagination. And the real Jesus is so much greater, so much more marvellous than anything we might imagine. He is, of course, frequently uncomfortable too, because he's not a figment of our imagination. As the folk in our passage this morning are about to find out, Jesus meets and speaks to three groups of people in our passage this morning. And as he does so, the question is, will they accept him as he really is rather than as they think he is? So the first group, verses 1 to 9, we meet the Pharisees and the scribes, the teachers of the law. The second group, verse 10, a very brief conversation, just one verse in a short and revolution, but revolutionary statement. And then thirdly, he has a conversation with the disciples who once again get their own private seminar as they seem to be falling behind. They haven't got a clue what's going on. What I want to do this morning is look at each of those three brief conversations. And as we do so, ask ourselves, what was it? about what Jesus was saying that challenged the understanding of those to whom he was speaking. Things that they must take on board if they're going to be following the real Jesus rather than one of their imagination. So firstly, let's have a look at the first group, uh, the religious experts, 15 verse 1. It's clear that Jesus has been creating a bit of a stir we saw that a week last week or so when we saw that he was uh, coming under the radar of the secular authorities, Herod uh, and his crew. And now he's coming under the radar of the religious authorities too. Verse 1, then some Pharisees and teachers of the law, scribes, came to Jesus from Jerusalem. So these guys are not just the local folk. Uh, news of Jesus has spread all the way from the backwater of Galilee uh, to Jerusalem, the capital. And a deputation has come from them to check him out. They look for him, they find him. 
but they're not terribly impressed with what they find. Verse 2. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Well, not impressed is probably putting it a little too mildly. They're shocked. They're annoyed. Actually, they're outraged. Your followers don't wash their hands before they eat. And you let them? What on earth do you think you're doing? This was not a hands-face space for physical hygiene or public health reasons. They were not bothered about E. coli or COVID or food poisoning. Their concern was about religious purity. Now, as we look at these guys, I don't want to make the mistake of painting them as some sort of pantomime villain. It's easy to do that. What I want to do, though, this morning is take their objections and concerns seriously. Try and understand it. Try and stand in their shoes and see what their problem was. Because remember, these folk took God and their relationship with God seriously. And that's not a bad thing. They took living out their faith and obedience to their Lord seriously. And that's not a bad thing either. And they took the scriptures very seriously. They were scholars of the Old Testament. They spent many hours reading it and studying it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. So in the light of all that, it's striking, I think, here, that they get things so terribly wrong. And it's sobering as well, because it means that you can take your relationship with God seriously. You can take your faith seriously. You can read and study the Bible and take it seriously. And yet that's no guarantee that you understand it or get things right. Or that you get Jesus right. Clearly they didn't. They were completely blind to him. Or they were, although at the same time, being convinced that they were completely right. And that surely is something that those who take God seriously and take their faith seriously and take the Bible seriously and are convinced in their own mind that they understand things right, understand Jesus right, surely need to take on board. Well, let's look at the conversation he has with them and see what we can learn. The question in verse 2, if you look at it, assumes two things. First, it assumes that Jesus' disciples should be washing their hands in accordance with the traditions of the elders. And secondly, it assumes that unclean hands defiles food and eaten defiled food defies, defiles the eater. And you see, those are the two assumptions that they've got. How does Jesus reply? They've told him what they think. What does he want them to learn? Where does he challenge their thinking? Well, you see, he replies, verse 3, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that, that what might have been used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honour father their mother with, or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Jesus gives a three-pronged attack. Do you see, first he rebukes them for their tradition. Hand-washing wasn't commanded in the Old Testament, but they'd established their own laws and rules and regulations for reasons that we'll see in a moment, and we're using them as justification to break the fifth commandment, honour your father and mother, a clear command of God. Then secondly, to give a second example, they use clever but false arguments to undermine the word of God whilst lining their own pockets. So they said, if someone has promised to give money to support the temple, they no longer need to support their parents. Jesus says to these Bible-loving folk who seemingly took God seriously, 
that taught their own traditions as though they were scripture, his verdict on them is, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. You say the Bible is the most important thing to you, but in practice, your traditions are more important. You honour God with your lips. You talk a good talk. It sounds good, but it's rubbish. More than that, it's deceptive rubbish, and it's deceiving and wrong. You honour God with your lips, but your hearts are far from him. As the psalmist puts it elsewhere beautifully, I think, their talk is as smooth as butter, yet there is war in their hearts. You worship God in vain, you hypocrites. What you teach is not the word of God. Your teaching is of human origin, dressed up as something it is not. They honoured God with their lips, true. Trouble was, they missed the fact that the problem was with their heart. Well, we learn more of their mistake in the next conversation that Jesus has with the crowd. Verse 10. Jesus calls the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. So here Jesus challenges their framework of understanding the one that led them astray. You see, their idea was that they had the idea that some stuff was clean uh, and okay for a Jew to eat, and the other food was unclean and so to be avoided. The clean and the unclean of the Mosaic law. And Jesus says something incredibly radical here. Do you see? He challenges that whole understanding, their whole understanding of the Mosaic law and what it means to be God's people. You see, at the heart of Jewish identity was the idea of being separate, to be pure as the people of God. And the Mosaic law did say that some food was okay, clean, and some was not unclean. That was just the way things were for them. So whilst Gentile sinners might eat anything, because they're unclean anyway, the Jew was to be separate and only eat that which was clean. Now given that was the case, can you see how radical Jesus' statement is here? And how challenging to them? I mean, we might read verse 10 as a self-evident truism, but for these Jews, it's very radical. This dismissal by Jesus of the Pharisees' dietary laws is the prelude to a revaluation of the whole of the Old Testament law, the whole of the Old Testament, which, if you, if you think, is necessary if the, if the gospel is, uh, if the disciples are take, to take the gospel to all nations, as they will be commanded to at the end of the gospel. So do you see what Jesus is saying to these religious leaders, these top, these bigwigs from Jerusalem? He's daring to say to them that they've completely misunderstood their scriptures. I mean, it's no wonder they took against him, is it? The Pharisees and teachers of the law feel that the problem, uh, the problem with them <laughs> is, is not that they don't know their scriptures, it's that they misread them. As Paul would say later on in the New Testament, they pursued the law as a way of righteousness. They pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone. They honoured God with their lips, true. Trouble was, they missed the fact that the problem was not an external one. It was with their hearts. It wasn't unclean hands that was the problem. It's unclean hearts. And no amount of washing or religious ritual changes the heart. Now I want to say that I've no doubt that they were very sincere in what they believed. They believed it fervently. And they believed they were right in what they thought. And could quote chapter and verse to support it. I don't think they were necessarily conscious of their hypocrisy. They were simply convinced about the rightness of their approach. 
and didn't appreciate how badly they'd misread things or the significance of misreading it. Remember, they're being consistent with their framework of understanding. It's just that framework of understanding that it was external things, like eating unclean food, that made people unclean was wrong. Their actions were consistent with it, but their thinking was wrong. Seriously, fatally wrong. But they were at least, at least, at least being consistent, weren't they? What they failed to understand, failed to realise, was that fundamental principle was wrong. That their problem isn't an external one. It's a heart problem. But they just couldn't see it. And so they read the scriptures in a way that reinforced their misreading. As I've been reflecting on this this week, I wonder if their experience isn't a bit of a salutary warning, especially to those who take God seriously, especially to those who take their relationship with God seriously, of the dangers of, of confirmation bias, the danger of only seeing in the scriptures that which already supports what you already think about Jesus and his purposes with the result that you're blind to your own mistakes and misreadings. It's a danger we all face, I think. And we must hope that if we are going wrong, someone will tell us. And of course, we're all wrong at some point, because none of us are God. We must hope that someone will point it out to us, and we'll have the humility to hear it. I confess, actually, that I worry that, that many, much, many of the models or frameworks of thinking of, uh, of many of the models of Christian counselling, uh, that the fundamental framework owes more to psychoanalytical theory uh, and writers than biblical writers. And that in a similar way to the scribes and the Pharisees, the most enthusiastic advocates of Christian counselling or some forms of it are, are blind to the fact that their framework is less biblical than they think it is. Uh, but perhaps, as I say, that's a conversation for another day. That said, we all risk this danger of confirmation bias. All of us, as we read the Bible, need to be alert to it and work hard and help one another work hard at ensuring that our framework is subject to being corrected by the biblical teaching. And that means to welcome and engage with constructive criticism. Okay, let's take stock. The discussion began at the beginning of the chapter with the issue of clean and unclean hands and following traditions of the elders. And it has ended with Jesus dismantling Jewish exclusivity with a re-evaluation of the whole of the Mosaic law. I mean, the religious folk were right, that impurity was an issue. But the fundamental issue of impurity, of relating to a holy God, didn't to do, wasn't to do with the externals, it was with the heart. It was not a question of mixing with the wrong people, eating the wrong food, touching the wrong things. Food, in through the mouth, out through the gut, makes no difference. It's irrelevant. What matters is not our guts, but our hearts. And this is even clearer as we look at the third conversation in this passage, Jesus' conversation, his private tutorial with the disciples. At verse 15, Peter, uh, as, uh, uh, as typically is, Peter's a spokesman, and he asks Jesus to explain. Verse 15, verse 16, Jesus explains. Uh, perhaps a little exasperated. And he tells them, look guys, it's not what we eat and digest, verse 17. It's what we think and say that reflects what we think that matters, verse 18. It's our heart that is the problem. Now for the avoidance of doubt, we're not talking about the four-chamber biphasic pump in the left of our chests. Okay, the heart is the very essence of our being. It's a bit of me that makes me, me, and the bit of you that makes you, you. It's our heart. 
And the heart is revealed by what we think and say. As one, uh, one preacher I heard once said that, you know, if, if he could see their hearts, the congregation's hearts, he wouldn't want to be preaching to them. Uh, and if the congregation could see his, his heart, they certainly wouldn't want to be listening to him. It's the heart that needs to be dealt with, needs to be changed, needs to be cleansed, if you or I are to know a holy God. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. A cliche, I know, but true. Yet for all their studies of the scriptures, for all their learning, for all their religious zeal and protestations about worshipping God, tragically, these guys, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, had missed it. And they're not alone in that. As an illustration of how we still make the same mistake today, I I wonder how often it is that you hear in the news or uh, read in the newspaper how the problem, the solution to a problem that we face is better education. Uh, We recognise the horror, don't we, and the abuse of the stories on the website Everyone's Invited. How are we going to deal with that? Or more lessons on consent? We recognise the problem of knife crime. How are we going to deal with that? Well, more teaching in the schools about the dangers of knives. Now, by all means, teach about consent, alert people to the problems of knives, but don't think for a moment that that's going to deal with the problem, because the heart is unchanged. Well, how do the Pharisees and scribes respond to Jesus' devastating critique? Well, we don't have to imagine, do we? We get it in verse 12. Do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Well, that makes them pretty normal, I reckon, don't you? When folk are told that they're the problem, it certainly takes a bit of humility, a certain poverty of spirit to accept that you're the problem. Well, if they were offended what they'd heard to date, uh, I wonder uh, what they made of what comes next. Uh, And perhaps it was a good thing that they didn't hear it. Uh, at this stage anyway. Verse 13, Jesus replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Wow. I mean, wow, blind guides leading the blind. Remember who he's talking about? These guys from Jerusalem? These religious bigwigs, these serious Bible scholars down from Jerusalem, in what they are saying, in what they are doing, they're not only mistaken in their understanding, they're not only giving human traditions the same authority as God's word, not only worshipping God in vain, not only self-serving hypocrites, that would be bad enough, wouldn't it? Here, Jesus' words are even starker. They're evil. When they insist that God says this, and he doesn't, when they teach, you must do that, when there is no such obligation, when they place folk under a burden of obligation that does nothing, absolutely nothing, to address people's real need, whilst at the same time persuading them that it does, Such a thing, Jesus says, is evil. They are doing the devil's work and will be judged severely as a result. Hell itself awaits them. Well, did you see that coming? I thought they were just a bit confused. And to show I hope that I'm not over-reading these words, keep a finger in chapter 15 and turn back a couple of pages to chapter 13. We had the parable of the weeds in that animation earlier in the meeting. Look now at Jesus' explanation of that parable, chapter 13, verses 36 and following. 
They, uh, the disciples asked for an explanation of the parable and Jesus answered. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Well, let's just turn back to chapter 15. And lastly, briefly, uh, did you notice that Peter asked Jesus to explain the parable? But what Jesus does is something slightly different. He doesn't explain the parable, does he? It's as almost what he does is repeat his teaching on the clean and unclean. It's as almost as though the plight and the end of the Pharisees and scribes that he's just talked about, serious though it is, is less important for them to get a grasp of than the fundamental point that he's making. That their problem, our problem, everyone's problem, is not one of externals. Our impurity, our uncleanliness, that which needs to be sorted out is inter internal, not external. Use all the hand sanitizer you can get your dirty hands on and nothing will change. Purify the heart, change the heart. Ah, then something's changed. You're addressing the real problem. Now people can't change their hearts, of course, it's impossible. What they need, what we all need, is something only God can do. And the promise of the Christian gospel is that God will do just that. And that changes everything. So we finish. Let's, I just want to end with the words that Sarah read to us earlier from Ezekiel. Of what God promises to do for all when he comes and visits his people. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, forgive us, please, when we create a God in our own image and fail to see the truth of who you are revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and in your word. I pray that you would open our eyes, unblock our ears to see and understand the truths that you've revealed. Help us to understand that our problem is an internal one of impurity before you and help us Heavenly Father to see and understand and embrace how you've addressed that problem in the death and resurrection of your precious Son and pray Heavenly Father that you would give us all clean hearts put your spirit within us that we might be follow your decrees and be careful to keep your laws and we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen.